just to to jump right in and and I'm seeing some of the comments already coming in and it is fitting I think that we are holding this conversation on the day that we remember the assassination of of Minister Malcolm X. Um, I can't say that we were prescient enough to have planned it that way, but I think everything is is in alignment as we talk about what it means for us to be safe, uh, perspectives on community safety from Black America, uh, and this report, this study that was a, a long process, but absolutely crucial uh, to understanding what safety means to us, what it requires, uh, and the kind of work that is happening on the ground across the country to define safety and to create safety for ourselves. So I want to just jump right in uh, to the questions and really just leading with you, Dr. Cohen. And if you can just talk a little bit about why you think why it was important to dive into Black people's perspectives on safety and provide some of the context that led to the study from your perspective uh, with the University of Chicago and Gen Forward. Yeah, so I'm going to start by giving a little background on Gen Forward and then talk about why this report in particular. So let me just say in many ways that um, this project, this report, really this conversation for me is the reason I built Gen Forward back really in 2016. Um, my focus and the, I think the work of the team has always been about centering and amplifying the voices of black people. So I've watched over the years as increasing number of people who kind of call themselves pollsters have represented data that they create as representing some public, right? And usually those surveys barely represent black people and they have far too few respondents to truly kind of pay attention to the kind of nuances and intersections that define black life and black communities. Uh, so Gen 4, I think does something different than that, right? So we, for example, we might wanna know not just how black people think about an issue but how black people in the South compared to black people in the Midwest and to build our campaigns, understanding those differences. So Gen 4 tries to do something we call oversampling, right? We make sure we have a lot of black people or we center only black people in our surveys so that we can represent the complexities, including where we agree and where we disagree. Gen 4 was also built to center the voices, the experiences, the actions, right? of young adults. Again, while folks my age should of course have a say, we wanted to ensure that young people were at the center of our conversations about what is and should be happening in black communities. And, and finally, let me just say, we built Gen4 because I believe that survey data can actually be a critical resource within social movement infrastructure, right? That it allows us to hear to be in conversation, to be in dialogue and solidarity with black people and to hear how they are thinking about issues. Of course, folks are doing one-on-ones and listening, but we have an opportunity through survey data to have our campaigns informed by how black people are or how they think about an issue at that moment. It is not to say that is how they will always think about it. In fact, it is the work of organizers to move people but if we don't respect how black people think about an issue and take the time to listen and understand that, then in fact, I think we are doing ourselves a disservice in the movement. Now, two quick questions, two quick moments and then I'm gonna let you. So I wanna say that I said all that, but also realize that none of us should be trusting of researchers come, coming into community bearing gifts, right? We know that in fact, social science methods have been used to demonize, to pathologize Black people. So having said that, it means that we have to work together as we build these surveys. Devante will tell you that we worked a long time and they were there from the beginning. They were there with us to think about what the questions should be, what the topics should be, how to think about the data, how to analyze the data. So it has to be a kind of long-term commitment. The last thing I'm gonna say is, movement should be thinking very selectively about who they work with, right? Who are the researchers who have a history of being in conversation and in movement space so that in fact, we can trust each other and build these projects. 
But fundamentally, this is about saying Black people have complicated and nuanced ways of thinking about public safety. And we will not allow a mainstream media or anybody else to kind of pigeonhole Black thought into a yes and no without the complexity that it deserves. And that's what this project is about for me. All right. Absolutely. No, you bring up some really critical points, especially about the relationship between academia, researchers, and the Black community, uh, and the things that we have to keep keep an eye out for, um, because oftentimes that relationship has been fraught. And it's especially important for movement because we, we do use data, we use research to inform our advocacy and our organizing, but we have to be very specific, if you will, about who we partner with and the ways in which we, we make those partnerships. So we're so fortunate to have Jen Forward uh, as a partner in this space. And I wanted to turn over to Devante, uh, just from the perspective of the Movement for Black Lives and why this research, why this report uh, was so was so timely and was so important for, for our work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so first of all, we wanted to cohere the Movement for Black Lives ecosystem um, of organizations around a strategy rooted in the invest, divest pillar of the vision for Black lives, which is our overarching policy platform that lays out our vision for the society we hope to usher in. Um, and the invest, divest pillar seeks to address the mass incarceration and criminalization of Black communities by reducing the police state and expanding social welfare and public health infrastructure throughout the US. Um, and we knew that before developing a strategy or our campaign that we needed to do some research. Um, we needed to talk to black people to better understand how black constituencies across the country are resonating with the important issues that our members were taking on in their local communities across the country. And now these issues range from alternative response models, which Kat will be speaking on a little bit later, uh, to violence interruption programs, which Tarun will be speaking on a bit later, um, to programming for formerly incarcerated populations, reform of the bail system, addressing the impact of the war on drugs, and many, many more issues. Uh, so we polled our organizations within and for BL on the issues that they were working on and restructured a campaign working group at and for BL to develop a series of questions with Jen Forward uh, that would guide our research process. Um, we then also did state-based polling and conducted a focus group with the research firm Hit Strategies and partnered closely with Jen Forward to embark on a nationally representative poll of Black communities. Um, and we knew that this process would be essential um, to really guide our strategies as we work to actualize the invest, divest pillar of the movement or of the vision for Black lives. So we really wanted to get, ground ourselves and how Black folks and Black communities are really resonating um, with the issues that we have been prioritizing throughout the ecosystem. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm eager to dive into the methodology and some of the report highlights. But before we go into that, I would love to hear from both Kat and Tarun, who are doing this kind of work live uh, on the ground in person. Can you both talk just briefly about what you were doing, what was happening, say, around 2020 when the uprisings occurred and in the last several years, the last four years, if you will, what was happening in your work, uh, the work that you do that's currently manifesting in these alternatives to police? Just give us a little bit of context of how that work has evolved. And we'll start with Kat and then we'll go to Tarun. Sure. We're First, I want to say thank you so much for having me. I want to give a shout out to M4BL for the amazing Congress um, that they just put on. And we talked about El Haj Malik Shabazz. Also, just a shout out to Dr. Minister Huey P. Newton, whose birthday was on the 17th. Um, so for us, I actually have to step back to 2015. Um, so in 2015, the Oakland Police Department murdered 11 Black men with impunity. 
um, on her way to a town hall about policing. The then mayor, Libby Schaaf, drove past the body of Demaria Hogg. He had been sitting in his car, murdered by the Oakland Police Department for hours. Um, and then early in 2016, a young woman named Celeste Guap came forward um, and revealed that she had been trafficked, uh, raped, um, coerced uh, by not just OPD, but by 14 Bay Area police departments. Um, the way I tell that story is we were at the protest outside of OPD. I was smoking a cigarette with my then policy director, James Birch, and I said, what the bleep? Are we paying them for? And then James Birch went on a mission and came back with our city budgets. Um, and so we launched um, our version of defund here in Oakland in 2016 um, and, and forced um, folks to insert this conversation into any budget conversations that were happening in the city. Fast forward to 2020, um, Libby Schaaf, the then mayor, tried to enforce her second curfew. Devante, you remember the first one in 2015, which we shut down and stopped. But our second curfew on Black folks um, saying um, we have a right to assert our right to breath. Um, and about 8,000 people came out. And I think it's important to note that this was at the height of the pandemic and 8,000 people came outside. And we were somewhere in the middle of the program where all of a sudden the masses were chanting defund OPD. So it had been a long, slow burning campaign uh, until we got to 2020. Um, using that leverage, we then launched uh, the Reimagining Public Safety Initiative here. Uh, we did get the Oakland Police Department, or excuse me, the City Council to commit to divesting 50% of OPD's resources to be redirected into violence prevention. They now have amnesia about that, um, but it was definitely a movement, it included a whole task force. We watched the ways in which the state interrupted it, including planting community members that were very much pro-police with black faces to push back on the work. Um, and then we've been fighting, I think, like a lot of people here, right, on the mainstream media narrative that this work is done, it's over, that they won. Um, the thing that I uplift a lot is that even though there was so much pushback on defund and we saw a lot of electeds really roll back on their promises from that time, one of the things that we can hold on to as a victory is the fact that even in middle America, people are acknowledging that police should not be crisis responders, right? You've got folks in Kansas that are like, yes, this no longer makes sense. Why would we send a badge and a gun when people need care and compassion, right? If 50% of who law enforcement kills have a disability and half of those folks are in mental health crisis, why are we doing that? And I think that that's the opening that as organizers, um, we have the space to push through. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that important context and really going back uh, to 2015. Tarun, anything to add about uh, what Kat has shared as it relates to some of the foundational components that led to this work and how the work, your work has has evolved? Um, thank y'all for having me. Uh, sorry for late joining. My laptop went out on me today and then I'm, I'm feeding kids, so I just ran out of there. So Sorry also, for if you can introduce yourself, your name, organization for folks so they know where you're coming from. So I'm Sharon Moore, um, co-founder of People's Advocacy Institute and uh, co-director of Strong Ones of Mississippi, which is a credible message program that we created here in the uh, state of Mississippi. Um, so the, what the question was again? Talk about what was happening in the lead up to to the present day in your work. How has it evolved? Kat talked went back to 2015, um, just talking about what the dynamics were that led to just this work in alternatives to police uh, to police response. Okay, so uh, I guess the work started for me in 2017 when I returned home. But I was a I was a young person sentenced to life. What I at the age of 17, um, I did 19 years in prison. And uh, my time in prison, I knew uh, that I wanted to help people not make those mistakes that I made when I came home. So when I came home, we started a nonprofit and we had some community meetings because violence was like starting to rise around the and especially our youth, you know. And so we had some community meetings and uh, we gathered people from the community. We started with people's assemblies and just asking people what they wanted to see change in Jackson and what they wanted to see happen with our young people recognizing that it was a lot of um, 
inadequacy when it came to young people. They didn't have things to do, you know, after school programming, um, money for education had disappeared. And it was just like, you know, we were suffering. And so after a year of strategizing, we decided it was going to create strong arms of uh, Mississippi. Uh, we made a partnership with the youth court and we started getting kids as a referral. At the same time, we were studying other models like cure violence. And um, we saw that around the country. We I took some cure violence training myself, but we got people who was already kind of doing that work, some training and just put them in the community and, um, you know, helped them to set that establishment together. So now um, we hit. I think we hit the ground in like 2019 and um, it's 2024. And now we, we tasked with the um, creating the office of violence prevention for the city of Jackson, which some um, other States around the country have done. We partnered in with them and it's now it's like they acknowledging our work and the work we've been doing. And so now they want to partner in and more people are joining to try to help uh, combat the issues of poverty, the, you know, the lack of resources and, you know, uh, all the trauma and, and violence that go on within our youth and within the community. And I guess later I'll talk more about that. Thank you so much for, for that context. Um, it's really interesting to see how the work has evolved in recent years and you're mentioning how it's grown and expanded. And so I wanna just turn back to uh, Dr. Kumar and Dr. Cohen to walk us through the methodology for this report. We've, we've given the context of how we got here. We've heard from those who are doing the work on the ground and how their work has shifted. I want to pivot back to the report and, and kind of dive into uh, what was the methodology used? And then after that, just talk about some of the, the top lines that we've that we've seen. So perhaps, uh, Dr. Kumar, I'll start with you. Yeah, um, I'll speak a little bit to, uh, to the methodology before um, passing it back to Kathy. So um, the report is based on a survey that we um, conducted in March 2023. Um, we surveyed 3,430 respondents, um, uh, 3,430 Black respondents across the United States. Um, this, uh, the, our goal was to ensure that this sample, uh, this large sample of survey respondents, was nationally representative of the Black community in the U.S. Um, and that, as, as, as Kathy mentioned earlier, um, that enables us to actually look closely at the breadth of experiences and views in the Black community. Um, we also oversampled young adults and we oversampled by region. And what this means is we, we recruited additional respondents under the age of 40 um, and additional respondents in particular regions around the US to make sure that we had enough respondents in those categories by age and by region that we could meaningfully break down our responses and ask questions like, do these, do the responses to this question, do these views vary across generational groups and um, acro across regions in the US? Um, those oversamples are made possible by Jen Forward's earlier work back in 2016 onwards to build a panel of respondents um, it, in collaboration with uh, North, the organization that administers our surveys, uh, to build a panel that worked hard to recruit respondents that were often left out of um, other surveys and polls um, that are conducted, um, speaking a little bit to um, what Kathy said earlier about the formation of Jet Forward. Um, so that's a little bit about the sample. Uh, we developed the questionnaire itself in collaboration um, with a team at M4BL, as Devante uh, mentioned earlier. And I think the important part of that collaboration that combined the M4BL team's experiences, expertise, and policy platform, and Gen Forward survey research experience. Um, so some of the questions built on questions that past Gen Forward surveys had asked, and other questions were new questions developed um, in collaboration to. Um, meet the, the goals of the survey. Um, the survey was about 80 questions long and respondents were compensated um, for their time. An 80 question survey is a long, uh, is a long survey um, um, and was fielded over the course of uh, three weeks in March, 2023. I'll stop there, but happy to answer more questions about the methodology. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Kumar. And also I want to encourage people, if you do have questions as you're hearing, uh, from our panelists to please drop them in the Q&A and we will try to get to them uh, in the program. Uh, so quickly turning to Dr. Cohen, now that we have 
a clearer sense of the methodology and sort of what went into the report, what were some of the top findings uh, from, from the survey? All right, so I'm going to give two or three data points that I think are important. I suspect Devante or Kumar or you might have others. So I'll do my two or three and then we'll go from there. I also just want to thank everybody, but in particular Kumar, who did a lot of heavy lifting to get us to this point. And uh, it's just really important uh, data. The other thing I just want to say is to Kat's point and to everyone's point here, it's I don't think any of us believe that the data, well, some some pieces are surprising, but what we want is to be able to use the data to support the work that's already being done, right? To, you know already, you know, as Kat was saying, that in fact, folks have now realized, we, I mean, and, and Black people have known for a long time, we don't want the police, well, we don't want the police, but we don't want the police handling mental health issues, right? something we all knew, but now we have data that we can use to say, look, majorities of black people, and we have other data that say majorities of other folks don't want the police handling, right, um, mental health issues. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, let's start with one data point that I think is important, and that is the fear that black people have of calling the police in an emergency or crisis situation. And what's what's troubling, not startling, but troubling for me about the data is that I think we all know that Black people don't trust, right, dislike, avoid calling the police. But it was really the language, and I think the M4BL team insisted on this, the language of fear, do you fear calling the police, that I think we should take note of, right? The fact that over 50% or 50% of Black people would say, I fear not I hesitate or I avoid, but I fear calling the police. The entity that in fact the state, the racial state, the racist state has said, this is the entity that you have to have to protect yourself, right? Unless of course, folks like Kat and others are building alternative institutions rooted in black communities to protect black people, right? Now the flip side of this data point that is so troubling is that when you ask folks, if you were in crisis, right? If you needed help, would you call the police? Again, 50% of black people say yes. Again, not because they want to, but out of necessity. It is this issue, this paradox that they have forced us into, which is, of course, we want to protect our communities, our families, ourselves, but the option that is given is an entity that in fact, kills black people, right? And so how do we make sense of this, right? It is contradictory data, but it speaks to the condition of needing an alternative and a reimagined sense of what public safety is. It is our call right now. All right, the other data point I just wanna mention and talk about is the question of um, should we abolish the police and um, you know, we all know abolition is complex, um, that people have very different approaches, but what we do know also from doing enough surveys is that um, there is not majority support for abolishing the police even among black people. I think it's important to kind of state that, right? In its current form, because in fact, the mainstream media has used it to say, look, you all say abolish the police and most black people don't want to abolish the police, right? That is their, that's their retort. Now, the thing is, is that that is one data point. What we know from this study, from this survey is that when you ask black people about their complex relationship to policing, they are very clear that they don't want policing as it stands, right? So um, they are very willing to say that we think we should divest either the entire or part of the budgets of police forces and use those for mental health, for education, for social services. Um, black people are willing to say, I believe in fact we should build a new agency of first responders that think first about mental health and less about kind of physical violence and containment, right? Um, so, one of the things I wanna kind of 
urge is that we have to push back against these kind of singular data points that are meant to represent Black people's position on something like policing and instead insist from the media, from politicians, from whomever, that the complexity of the ways in which Black people are situated, right, a fear but needing alternative resources, means that in fact they have nuanced ways of understanding their relationship to policing and have kind of liberatory ways of thinking about what comes next. Not just abolish, but what do we rebuild, right? It's not just divest, it's invest. And I think one of the things that you see in the report is this kind of complex way of both saying here is the harm, but here is the vision of what we want to make our community safe and thriving. And, and I think that's some of the important data points that I would point. Thanks so much, Dr. Cohn. You give us a lot to think about just in terms of the language uh, that was used, the wording of questions. And I know that there, there are some questions coming in from the audience about how particular questions are asked and the assumptions that we may make about people's understanding of different terms. These are all absolutely uh, important questions that we have to think about in a study of this kind. I wanted to uh, turn to you, Devante, and just ask you if uh, Dr. Cohen has, has highlighted some points in the report, and I wanted to see what your response was to some of the findings. Did anything surprise you uh, about the survey, uh, the data as it was coming in? Yeah, um, there were definitely surprising elements um, that came um, to front from the survey. Um, and prior to conducting the survey, our team had an inclination that Black communities would actually resonate with alternative approaches to public safety if we gave the space to articulate the logic behind these priorities. Um, and I did not expect the overwhelming support we had once we better articulated what our communities were trying to accomplish. Um, and I think this support indicates that Black community want to see a different approach to public safety that doesn't rely on policing and incarceration to make us safe. Um, folks have a keen understanding that public health and social welfare is in fact public safety. And some of the data points that really came out to me um, when it, uh, and I'll just read off the questions. To what extent do you support or oppose each of these reforms, hiring mental health professionals as non-police first responders to de-escalate mental health crisis across age group? And we know Gen Z and millennials are going to be more um, in support of radical demands. But even on this question around hiring mental health, um, professionals um, as non-police responders, even um, boomers were in support of these kind of alternatives. Um, also, when it came to divesting from police and investing and strengthening the social infrastructure like housing, education, and healthcare, again, across age, this was widely supported among Black communities. And one more that I'll, I'll lift up, um, would you support increasing federal funding for states to establish crisis response that does not rely on incarceration, like putting people in jails and prisons? Again, there's overwhelming support across um, age groups on this. And I'll also say that this also um, was widely supported across partisanship that both Democrats and Republicans um, were in support of these priorities that were articulated um, as questions in the report. Um, and so I think what is important for us to take away from this is that if given the opportunity to demonstrate that these alternatives for public safety are in fact viable, if we scale, have the opportunity to scale them up and resource them in the way that they need, that our communities will actually get behind these um, alternative approaches to public safety. Um, and so I'm really 
encouraging our members, folks who have um, access to this report to use it in their organizing strategies, that this actually reinforces what we've been saying all along, that we actually keep us safe. Um, and so throughout the report, um, again, there's overwhelming support for these alternatives. And, and the question is an organizing question now, can we scale up these alternative approaches? Can we actually resource them in the ways that are needed to build alternatives uh, for safety in our communities? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Devante, for, for that offering and just for helping us to dig, to dig a, little, a little bit deeper. Now it is, Black History Month or Black Futures Month, as we like to call it. And so I just wanted to drop a little point about the Freedom House Ambulance Service. Uh, for those who may or may not be familiar, this was the first emergency medical service in this country, in the United States, to be staffed by paramedics with medical training beyond first aid, founded in 1967 to serve the predominantly Black Hill District of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and it was staffed entirely by Black people. So when we talk about alternatives, we're not just talking about something that we can do in the future. We are talking about something that our people have been doing, uh, have been put in place, have been working out. And it's important to lift that up uh, because we're really trying to lean into how can we build systems that actually are affirming of our lives, that reflect our values in our communities when we know that we're existing uh, in, in a hostile society. And so I wanna turn back to uh, Kat and Taryn uh, just to talk about what the response has been in the community from when you're out there doing the work residents, how, how are they responding to this alternative system that's been put in place? Do you have anything that you can lift up about that, what that community response from our people has been like? Sure, I can go. There's so much I want to say. First, I just want to double down on what you just said um, in terms of none of this is new. We have always take care of, taken care of us, right? We have always known um, that we keep us safe. I mean, part of why the government declared the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program so dangerous is because we were remembering that we actually don't need the state, we need each other, and therefore gave us more space to buck the state uh, in liberatory struggle. Um, I think the other thing that I wanna say um, is that we're told from the time that we're in the womb and onward, right, that policing is how we are kept safe. So our children go to school, the cops come for show and tell day, they get little stickers on their sweaters, um, and we're told that the police are our friends. And then our black children make their way home from school via bus or walking or whatever, and they see um, cops hemming up black folks. Uh, they get home and an auntie's been arrested. Uh, somebody was murdered by law enforcement, and it creates a cognitive dissonance for our folks. Um, and then the state creates the conditions of poverty and desperation that do make our communities, um, I hate to use the word violence because we have to understand that that violence is connected to trauma and survival. And the only answer that we get to that, right, is funnel people into prisons. And so um, our theory of change, and Miriam Kaba has talked about it, is the only way that we're going to get out of this, right, to not have to accept this as a normal paradigm is for us to be the answer. So if we're gonna tell our people don't call the police ever, then we have to be creating the models. We have to demonstrate to our folks that there are alternative pathways to safety for our communities and talk about what real safety looks like. And so in the vein of answering your question, that's what the response has been, right? Before we had funding and we really don't have that much now um, to really promote it, right? The first weekend that MH first opened in Sacramento in 2020, our phone lines were flooded. When we launched billboards in Oakland, California, the news um, stations did interviews and you had people saying, I am so grateful because to a point that somebody else made earlier, we can watch someone get blown away in front of our doorstep in broad daylight and we're not calling the police ever. As a survivor of domestic violence, I can tell you that I learned the hard way 
right? That when you call the police, we are more harmed. And I spent 10 years in a relationship being battered and I never called the police ever because the first time that that happened, I was the one taken to jail. If we want to build a new paradigm, we have to show the people that we are the ones who keep us safe. And that's why this work is so important. And I'm I'm so grateful that for this report because it's data-driven solutions, right? What we're seeing across the country are knee-jerk uh, responses to the law and order drumbeat that is a backlash to Black Lives Matter, that is a backlash to movement for Black lives, that is a backlash to the 2020 rebellions. Um, and this is historically what happens over and over again. We have to assert ourselves as public safety experts. What we're talking about actually isn't radical, it's rational. And the only way that we can prove that is through practice. Absolutely. Uh, Taryn, I wanted to, to turn to you with that same question. What has the response been in, in your community to the work? So um, the response in the community has been, it's been a great response, I could say, over the last uh, couple of years. You got to think about where I am in Mississippi and us bringing this type of ideas to the table was, was met with some, you know, resistance or restraint. People didn't believe uh, this could work here. But um, I think uh, us like diving into the work and getting out in the community, like, cause we feel like we the community. So we got the answers and the solutions to all the problems that affect us most. And well, uh, steady saying that we're gonna get out here and meet people where they are and learning our community and learning what they need and then finding ways to get it. Like uh, Kat said, we didn't really get much funding to do that. We just was creative in our ways of doing it and showing people that we was committed to helping them. And so now I think um, it's an inspired, it inspired a lot of uh, programs to start being created here in Jackson that people realizing like, I can do this and kind of serve this role and help my community without, you know, policing or without always calling the police to uh, solve issues. So now we get we get calls about, you know, um, incidences of going on with different uh, people in the community and they willing to listen to somebody else to try to be a mediator for a lot of things that uh, we, I guess we weren't taught. Like uh, what, what we were saying earlier, like with the Black Panther movement, we always been like, we say credible messages now, but we always been credible messages to our people because of the things we went through and the thing, the way we survived through this country. And so like, I think um, it was kind of lost on us for a while. Like, like I say, we uh, are, where I'm from, it wasn't really a lot for kids to do anymore. People like um, disinvesting in. And so now we reinvesting in them and we reinvest in the community and we using our people to be the ones who saw those solutions and give those answers. And I think, uh, I think it's been a well reception. Like I say, uh, y'all know the history of Mississippi. You heard me say we creating the Office of Violence Prevention now. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we've been active, like, in not just violence roles, but, um, you know, community response. With the water crisis happened here, 1020 here, we all formed a community, like, coalition to, like, fight the things that's uh, affecting us and use the resources that we know how to get and get them to the people who need them. And like I said, it's just been an inspiring thing. Uh, a lot of different people have come in and, I feel like with, with me coming home from where I came home and what, you know, the things I went through, I done inspired a lot of guys who like me to feel like, like, man, your story really for somebody else. You know, sometimes the things you go through, you can use that to help somebody else not make those mistakes and use it as an example. And so that's what I mean when I see a lot of different programs popping up to offer different resources to the youth. Cause it was like for a time we had forgot that they was our kids and, you know, we, we like, uh, we around here, I'm gonna say it, they like to call the police, you know what I'm saying? But you know, we we trying to get that away from that and like cover the underlying issues that really lead to the problem that we're facing. I'm really, I'm just really glad about what you shared because it brings to mind this this thing that we have responsibility to do, which is to 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 demonstrate that we can self-govern as Black people. And this notion of self-governance, our ability to build institutions where we are able to govern ourselves with the underlying values that we, that we constantly talk about, the values that are missing in society at large, and how that builds credibility with our people, right? So if we're asking folks about abolition or defund, 
we have to be able to show what is that alternative. Um, Kat, you brought up the Black Panther Party uh, and the Free Breakfast Program, the things that they were doing that show that we actually can do them ourselves, that we have the capacity, the ability, and the creativity. That was another uh, word that I just pulled out from what you shared, uh, Taryn, to do, to do what we need to do and to do it better, right? And that is what will help us to build, to bring more people uh, into the movement, um, just showing them the work that you're both doing. I wanted to just do a, a little pivot back to Dr. Cohn and, and Dr. Kumar, because I know that there are some differences in response based on region. So I know there's a, a sort of regional breakdown. I wanted to kind of delve into that a little bit. We have a couple of questions in the chat that are asking about uh, the differences in region, the difference in responses based upon region. And there's also an interesting question about uh, the differences on policing across class and economic position. And I think that might be a bit of a broader question, but I wanted to pose uh, those to both of you and see if if you had any uh, insights. And I'll start with, with you, Dr. Kumar. Um, yeah, so let me um, you know, take the region uh, question first. Um, so this is part of like, working with um, um, the M4BL team. We were especially interested in making sure that we had good regional coverage. Um, but when we were looking at, I think maybe uh, uh, a surprising finding is um, in those questions where we asked about um, alternatives to policing, support was high and consistent across region. Um, there, there were some key differences. I think if um, uh, uh, the report doesn't show um, very many regional breakdowns because we did not find um, um, uh, a lot of variation. Um, there are some um, some types of experiences, particularly in the section of the survey where we asked about um, types of um, harassment, mistreatment, and abuse at the hands of the police that we see some regional variation, we see some gender variation too, um, but in the questions about support for alternatives to policing, see consistently high support across region. Kumar, Thank do you want to say something about uh, economic variation, which I know is not featured in the report? I know you're looking at the, at the top lines just like I would, so I don't know if you, have them right off the top of your head. And even, even with that, I, and I, I was mentioning that I think it's a broader question, but what we, you know, what we think about the economic, the variation based upon class and responses to police, whether in whether people feel that fear about calling the police and, and how that differs based upon class. Um, which also can be based on geography, even in your own city. And so I'll just give uh, a small example in Chicago, where I'm based. Uh, and we actually just had a study that came out. Uh, this is part of a longer term study that showed police responses that varied by neighborhood. So if you lived on the west side of Chicago, where I live, or on the south side of Chicago, that police in many instances were not responding at all. Response times were were extraordinarily long when compared to more affluent areas of the city. And so I think there is something to, to say about class differentials, which can be tied to geographic difference even within the same city and people's perceptions about police, whether the fear, trust, and the like. So I just wanted to offer that, uh, giving a, a perhaps a local example. Not having done the full study, but <laughs> I, I I think that the hesitation is the social science hesitation, right? Which is like, okay, did we we don't have that analysis right in front of us? But let's let's say this: we would expect, just as you said, that at, at some level you would expect that folks who are in affluent neighborhoods, where their relationship to policing could be different, right? Might there, there might be a difference and a and couple different things. One is one with the survey data, we can do that type of analysis. So if folks have questions that aren't covered in the report, like can you break the data down by economic position or we can do some of that. I, I wanna caution us to say that, you know, on, on previous studies where we thought, okay, well surely class or class position will make a difference. 
that is not always the case, right? Um, and so you can be a black person in an affluent neighborhood and still experience kind of racism, still experience the trauma and the kind of degradation of, of the police, uh, believing that you don't live in your neighborhood, still experience, in fact, your neighbors calling the police on you because they don't believe you should be in that neighborhood, right? So I wanna say that kind of class position, while clearly important, I don't think defines the experience of black people in the same way in the traditional social sciences they think that class does. And I think, Amara, that's what you were saying, right? That, that if we situate black people in relationship to class, of course, but also in relationship to their neighborhoods and communities, we know that middle-class black people, for example, again, on the South side of Chicago, don't receive the same services, opportunities that middle-class white people on the North side of Chicago do. So it is always filtered through the kind of long history of white supremacy and racism, right? But again, if people have other questions about breaking up the data uh, or looking at the data in different ways that we haven't already kind of detailed in the, in the report, we can try to do some of that analysis for folks. And I also wanted to ask, because it's, it's uh, come up and then uh, Kat will go to you, uh, whether the the data will be made available to those who want to read the report. I know I dropped the link into the chat uh, for those who want to actually read the the full report, but that question around uh, the data. Okay, so I I think it's more of an M for BL question, right? About um, how much of the data. So I think there are ways in which people can interact with the data, can look at some of uh, the cross tabs and and um, the top lines, but the question is about the raw data. So if people want to kind of have the raw data to do their own analysis, they should be in touch with us, uh, either with Devante or myself. Absolutely. Uh, that sounds good. And Devante, if you could also drop your email into the chat, that would be helpful. Uh, Kat, I wanted to go uh, over to you. Thanks. I just want to say two things. I was trying to do it in the chat and I'm over here struggling with technology, which tends to happen to me. Um, but the first thing that I think is really important for us to all sit with, and I'm sure most of us on this call know, our people want to feel safe. They don't necessarily want police. They've been lied to that police bring us safety. They know that's not really true, but it's all that they have been offered. And so when these alternatives are offered to them, that's why they gobble them down, right, in large numbers. Um, and I think the second thing is, and I don't have the answer to this, I'm super duper grateful for this report, we will use it at APTP, and we have mountains of research that show that cages and cops do not keep us safe. We know that, we know that from, you know, prestigious colleges. We know that from experts on the criminal legal system in this country. I think the bigger question for us is, particularly inside of the conditions, let's say of right now, right? When things are even a little bit worse um, than usual, how do we communicate this to our people in a language that they can actually digest in the middle of having seven kids and working six jobs and still not being able to pay the bills? with the levels of violence. I'm in Oakland, California, right? With the levels of violence that they real life are experiencing. And I think that abolitionists for too long have said, well, we don't have to talk about that right now. Let's talk about this thing over here that's easier. No, we actually do for black people in particular have to talk about that reality right now. And how do we use um, data as well as actual practice to do so? For sure, Kat, thank you for, for offering that um, to this conversation. I wanted to just turn back to Dr. Cohen. I know you have to depart a little bit early, so I wanted to just create a bit of space for you to offer some, some of your uh, just final thoughts on the report. And specifically, what are the implications of this report on our advocacy, on our policymaking, our advocacy, and our organizing? Well, I, I mean, I think it has already been said that um, what this has to do, and it's not necessarily new, this is, there are lots of other reports, I would say, but none, I think, grounded in the same way um, that 
were co-created with movement organizers and uh, scholars thinking about what is the liberatory journey for Black people and how do we respect and organize Black people at this moment, right? I think it is to Kat's point, again, the complexity of Black people's lives, taking seriously what does it mean to be in conversation, how do we learn from and organize with Black people, right? How do we create um, opportunities to demonstrate, in fact, that we can, in fact, protect and save ourselves, right? Um, it just feels like that this, the data points provide an opening, an opening for a conversation. And it also, I'm, I'm going to say, it, it provides a check for us, right? It says that we can be deeply committed to abolition, but if we aren't bringing Black people with us, or if they aren't with us right now, then I'm not sure where we're going. That is not to say that we shouldn't be abolitionists. It's to say that we have to think about how we talk about abolition in a way that moves Black people in response to their needs in the immediate moment, and also the liberatory journey that, in fact, we are all trying to move towards. So I, I think for, for me, data is an opportunity not to solve anything, but to just kind of register and anchor ourselves in thinking about how are we in conversation, how are we in solidarity with the complexity of Black people allowing folks to disagree with us and to have us all be in conversation about moving forward. So that's what I'll say. I'm just gonna say again, I so appreciate M4BL for not only kind of hosting this conversation, but for doing the long, long work of, of producing the data and writing this report. So it has been uh, a pleasure and an honor. All right, sorry, I have to leave y'all. No, we appreciate you taking the time and your remarks, which I just really resonate deeply um, because it just shows, at least in my view, the importance of the relationship between the work that you do in movement. And those who consider themselves to be organizers we don't just talk to our friends and family. We don't just talk to the people that we agree with. And we don't just talk to the people who are already bought into a particular worldview. In fact, our responsibility is to step out of those frames to engage the masses. And I think just the, the discussion and the debate is absolutely critical. And it's part of why this report is so important, because it helps us to dig a little bit deeper, as opposed to sort of taking a monolithic view or a simplistic view of our people. We are we are complex. We are multi-layered, multifaceted, and we have to take that into account in our work. So Dr. Cohen, you are deeply, deeply appreciated. And we are so grateful to have had you for this conversation. And for those who have tuned in, it will be recorded. So you'll be able to run the playback as many times as necessary. Um, but Dr. Cohen, we appreciate you. And for the rest of the panelists, just have a couple more questions uh, that are pulled from uh, some of the questions that have been asked in the chat. And I wanted to turn uh, again to, to Taryn, to Kat, and to Devante, uh, just on what Dr. Cohen has shared as we think about the implications of, of this on our work, you know, people are asking, what are there other examples? And this is more um, for the three of you, Devante, Taryn, and Kat. Are there other examples of the work that you're doing uh, in, in other cities, in other states? And what are the relationships like between your organization and others who may be doing this work? Because we know that you cannot operate in, in a vacuum. So I want to, to pose that question to, to the three of you. So um, I, I'll go first. Uh, that's that's a great question because like I said, uh, this is first work of its kind for the state of Mississippi. And we learned this at a, um, uh man why well, we had a town hall meeting at um at our city hall and um at mitchell and they group man up from um new york they came down and they told us about their program and so we was interested in their work and then we joined in and we went to a credible messenger summit and we saw different examples of that work being done around the country and so we decided well we need to come back to jackson and create something that works in jackson that way and similar with cure violence and so now, um, when I go out of town, I always connect with them when I keep in contact with them through the phone. Like we didn't build those relationships because like it's different regions, but it, we be having the same problems. And even though we might not sound the same, 
you know, it affects us the same way. And so we use those kind of examples from other people around the country to create we well, what we have done so far in Mississippi. And we still have partners from across the country doing similar things. And we listen to them as we plan and as we strategize and move the work forward. Thank you so much, Devante, and then and then Kat. Yeah. Um, so this work is um deeply low, like to stand up a non-police alternative, you have to be deeply connected to community and invested in the local space. Um, and InfraBL and other groups are really building momentum to connect these local communities, these local organizations to a national strategy. And that's what we're in the business of doing in this particular moment within InfraBL. Um, really thinking about how do we connect the local base building efforts to a uh, advocacy strategy that impacts federal policy um, and also garnering momentum to socialize the, the fact that we actually envision an alternative for community safety for all of our communities throughout the U.S. Um, and Folks spoke on it a, a bit earlier about how important it is to talk about the solutions. Um, we know that we are political actors and we want to be scientific in our approach. Um, and the right wing has pigeonholed many of our communities um, in the discourse around defund. They've made it very sensational. Um, and really ignore the investments that our communities have been pushing. Um, and so this work that we're embarking on is really um, about adding more nuance to the discussion. Also thinking about how do we talk to people um, when we do our door knocking, when we do our flyering, how are we talking to everyday people about these solutions um, and building those connections from a local to a national strategy. Um, and as folks were mentioning before, this work isn't new. Our communities have been doing this for a long time, um, oftentimes ignored by the media. Um, right now to amplify those local solutions that folks have been working on for years and to really demonstrate that we can self-govern, we can do the work of providing safety for our communities. Um, and that's deep uh, ongoing work that uh, many have already taken on. So I'm really excited about the momentum that um, has been built. Um, and how this report can reinforce the ongoing work that our communities have taken on. For sure, for sure. Over to you, Kat. There's so much to say here, and I want to be respectful of time. Um, the first thing I think I want to do is really ground us in the assault that has been waged on the defund movement and um, the ways in which non-carceral response to community crisis has been demonized and criminalized. Um, here in Oakland, for example, we've got the right wing trying to seed their movement here in Black Panther country saying that the work that we are doing has actually harmed community. Um, that just the idea, just saying the words defund or divest and invest, right? Because the first demand of our defund campaign was 50% of OPD's budget for 24-7 alternative mental health crisis. And so I just want us to all just hold that and know that there's been a coordinated national attack on our movement. And that's because M for BL, BLM, defund, reimagine, shook the status quo to its core because it made sense to people. Um, I think the the second thing that I want to say is the other thing that we've seen is what the state has always done, right? When they see a program by the people, of the people, for the people, led by the people, they try to co-opt it um, so that the people return to relying on the state. Um, we saw that here. We've seen that across the country. There are a lot of, in my opinion, very dangerous 
models out there, people presenting themselves as experts that communities are going to, um, this idea of co-response as if a social worker can stop a police officer from murdering someone in the middle of mental health crisis is trash. It's just absolute garbage. Um, the idea that, oh, we just need to rely on the medical industrial complex to switch out bodies, but not radically transform our ideology about the way we look at people in crisis um, without holding the fact that the medical industrial complex kills as many of us as the prison or police industrial complex does. Um, so here in Oakland, there was a, a white group, I won't say their name today, Devante, but there was a white group um, that after we had been banging on city council doors, like stole our demand, worked with other white council members and tried to make this a state program. And while we were also rolling out MH First, we had to be all up in their business. We had to make sure that formerly incarcerated people could get these jobs. We had to make sure that there was a community advisory committee. We had to make sure that they would incorporate our training. We had to make sure that there was funding. And so I also wanna say that, and I wanna say that even if your city is saying, okay, we're gonna do a program, A, you have to be all up in that business, but also B, a city program is never sufficient. You have to have programming that is completely divorced from the state for a large segment of our people to be safe um, with investing in and for the work to be doing what it is supposed to do. Because what the work is supposed to be doing is actually showing how what we're doing is not radical. It is rational. We should be the normal response. We should be the normal solution. Um, us taking care of us is absolutely what should be happening. Um, and so I think there's a lot of openings openings now. I think as we're barreling towards the 2024 elections and we're watching the right um, more and more try to seed the conservative politics, um, even in progressive cities like Oakland, um, and capitalize on the fact that they did not front load resources to our already troubled um, and divested from communities um, in advance of the economic pandemic that came on the heels of the coronavirus pandemic that made things go from bad to worse and then say that we are the problem and not the state, that it's all the more important for us to show our people that we actually, they actually, not we, because a lot of us say we from very privileged college educated seats. Um, I really appreciated, I think what Tarun said about meeting the people where they're at. Right. What do they need in this moment? What is their analysis and building from there? Um, yeah. I, I And communications as an organizing strategy. We've got to be talking to our people all the time. And then the last thing I'll say, because I'm trying to be cognizant of time, it is not that you take MH first and you drop it in Atlanta or you drop it in Mississippi, right? All that we can share are principles, values, and structure so that people can take those things, um, make them work for their city. And I think that's how we expand. Absolutely. That's a really important point. So uh, replication does not assume that every place, the model would just work the same way in every place. And again, this is the role of organizers, knowing the local context and tapping into local folks to construct something that makes sense for that locality is, is important in our work. It's important for whatever is put in place to work, right? So we're not just doing copy paste. Uh, we are trying to at least lift up what is happening and then folks can pull what works, tapping into local people so that they can adapt it to what makes sense in that specific area. So that's just a really important point uh, that I'm glad that you brought up. I want to turn just to this, this last question, and I feel like the time just ran, ran away. There's so much, it's such a, a rich report. I would encourage folks, again, the link to the report has been dropped into the chat uh, so you can, you can check it out. And Devante also dropped his contact information uh, in the chat. So for those who, who would like to get more granular data, but this, this question, we are in an election year, at least a national election year. We know the dynamics that have played out over the last, and I, I keep going back to 2020 because it was a watershed moment, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, and we know the dynamics that have played out since that time, uh, the rise in fascism. We've seen tremendous pushback and backlash 
against the work that has been done to uh, to shake up the status quo and to change the status quo. And now we're heading into an election. Um, the stakes are high. There's a lot of anxiety, et cetera. So this report is coming out against that backdrop. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear from all of you what what is going forward look like? What does the future look like, given what came out of this uh, perspectives on black 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 people's perspectives on community safety? What does the path forward look like for each of you? And I'll start with you, Dr. Kumar, from a research standpoint, uh, having been doing so much of the heavy lifting. What is it? What does the work look like going forward? What is the next steps? now that this report has been done, but what, what does the future look like uh, from your perspective? Um, yeah, um, from a research perspective, I'll just mention two things. Um, first, I think this kind of model of working in close collaboration, um, and I think particularly, right, the, uh, if you look in the report, there's a section with a list of um, uh, various policies of alternatives to policing that came out of M4BL's work and experience. Um, many of those kinds of questions have not been asked on national surveys uh, before, and many national surveys do not focus um, on uh, the Black community in, in particular with such a large sample. So then continuing to do that work and tracking how these views change over time will be important. Um, uh, right, the, a, a survey is a single snapshot in time, um, and it's important for us to learn about um, how the work of, of the various organizations represented here is um, shifting and moving um, um, views and beliefs over time. Um, and then also, I think I was just noticing some of the questions that are coming through in the Q&A um, that are asking, uh, taking some of these data points that have been shared um, and starting to ask about how are people actually thinking through this? How are they interpreting these questions? And that's where I'll note that Survey research is one kind of research that is good at some things, right? We can say something about a national population, but it is not good um, at, at things like asking about how are people interpreting um, um, these ideas. So I think pairing this with um, um, focus groups, interviews, and other kinds of research that will get us that depth of understanding um, of how people um, um, understand this, um, these terms, these ideas, interpret them and make meaning um, will be really important moving forward. Excellent, excellent points. Thank you for sharing, uh, particularly from a research perspective, is this, uh, this is not the last report. There, there will certainly be forthcoming work and we're excited to, to embark on uh, additional research going forward. I'll turn it to uh, to Taryn, and on that same question is what what the way forward looks like from your perspective uh, as someone who is doing this kind of work on the ground. So I um I appreciate the report, you know, because um, of the data that it offers and you know an example that it offers. I think moving forward, we got to continue to educate our people on what's going on, like, and most importantly, express the truth. Like what Kat was saying earlier, you know, the truth is caught up when folks saying, oh, they try to, they trying to fund the police. They trying to do something different. I was really trying to help our people. You know, the police ain't never really been for us. And the police system was designed, you know, for the slaves, really, you know what I'm saying, to bring us back to that. And so as we move forward and with data coming out, you know, revealing what the work, where it works at and using those points moving forward, I think we are, uh, I think we see better programs coming out, you know, more people getting involved where they can get involved in just maintaining and um, staying on the course, you know, as we celebrate back history when we're here because of people who sacrifice their lives and, you know, find ways for us to be where we are today. And so we got to figure out ways to engage our people more, to educate our people more. And, you know, it's time out for the ignorance, you know, we black people, we complex to a certain degree, but a certain thing that we got to, you know, put to the side. It's a time for everything. And, and the time right now is that we need to see change happen this 2024 and moving forward. I think it's a Kobe year. We need to be on some championship level moves. You feel me? I know you can feel me from Cali out there. So, hey, I appreciate you and everything you do. You know, standing in solidarity with you. And people that have this institute, we appreciate the opportunity to share. And we hope to continue moving forward and do this work with all of y'all. 
so appreciate that. We need to be operating at championship level. I love it. Kat, over to you. Hey, again, a lot I want to say, and I want to be respectful of time, solidarity with you all in Mississippi as well. Um, I think a few things. I think that we also need to hold the humanity of our people, the trauma of what they're actually experiencing, to not dismiss their lived experience with um, abolitionist or future hopes, right? Um because when we talk about things like, all right, well, we need to invest in housing or jobs or education, et cetera, things that we all know actually will keep us safe. And that actually, if they'd started doing it five years ago, like Oakland would not look the way it looks right now. Um, we have to be ready with those answers. Um, I think this the second thing we have to keep in mind is that COVID sort of interrupted organizing as some of us know it, right? Door knocking became difficult, being in the streets with our uh, people became difficult. Um, and so people started calling what they were doing online organizing. That's not organizing. If you're not building a base um, that can leverage power to actually change the material conditions of our people, then that's not organizing, right? That's just reactionary stuff that in some cases is valuable and in some cases is political masturbation. Sorry, it just is. Um, you can get 5,000 people out every weekend, great. But if you can't get them to come to your meetings, uh, go to city council, um, create their own models of safety, then I don't actually know what we're doing. And I think we have to figure out in this world, the pandemic is not over. It is here with us to stay. How do we um, get back to brick and mortar organizing in a way that keeps us all safe? Because to date, Black people are still the ones getting infected and dying. Um, and so how do we have those conversations? And also, how do we address the crisis of the pandemic for Black people so they can focus on this other stuff and expand the definition of public safety? Um, I think also that this report is critically important because how you ask the question is critically important. So the other side loves to put up reports and said, well, when we asked Black people if they wanted more police, they said yes. That's because you asked them, that's the only question you asked. You didn't then, as when we've knocked on doors, said, um, what would make you feel safe? What actually do you want? If violence interrupters or community ambassadors could produce the same results, would you champion for that? And resoundingly, it's a yes every single time. So it's organizing that gets the goods. And then um, last thing I'll say is APTP didn't always engage in policy. We do now. Um, we engage in what we call radical reform, right? Reforms that will chip away at the status quo. And we just had a pretty big win where we got um, $10 million, which isn't a lot of money, but it was $10 million diverted from the state budget so that grassroots organizations across the state could build their own models of non-carceral um, community crisis response. And so I think that's the last thing. I think it's all roads in that we have to dream big, fight big, organize big. Absolutely. Absolutely, Kat. Just so much, so many important statements, organizing, the basics, the 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 uh, nuts and bolts organizing, door knocking, talking to our people, which was interrupted because of the pandemic, but we, you know, we're creative, right? We We can come up with creative ways to engage our people and there's no way around that work. And so, constantly focusing on that. How do we organize our folks? How do we get information to our folks? And it's also important to celebrate wins when they occur, right? Yes. So can, can I say one, th one more thing? I'm sorry. Just one more thing. I'll shut up. I promise. The right is masterfully capitalizing off of the fear and trauma of our people. We have to be the healing justice balm. We have to be the ones that address their pain. And I know that that's difficult depending on where you are in the world, but I think that's gonna, that, that is key and it's critical um, because they have successfully through mainstream media narrative exacerbated all of the things that are already bad and we have to have actual solutions. That's it, thanks, sorry. No, that's, that's, that's so important. We have to have actual solutions. And I think that's what we are, that's why we're here. Uh, Devante, I want to turn it over to you. 
on that last question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Kat, taking some of the talking points I have, you know, lined up for this, they definitely thrive on fear and, and misinformation on the right. Um, and as we're approaching elections, I know we have primaries coming up in California next Tuesday. Um, and then uh, in November, the presidential election, um, we can already expect the usual discourse around safety, the tough on crime the versus soft on crime rhetoric. Um, and what we know is that the right thrives on the simplified reductionist conversation. They thrive on sound bites. They'll say defund or abolition and just leave the conversation there. My hope is that folks can take this report and be like, nah, fam, we can actually have a robust and honest conversation about what it requires to actually build thriving, safe communities. Um, and we already know that policing and incarceration is already reactionary. Um, and to be honest, they're not even doing good at being reactionary and responding to the crime and violence in our communities. Oftentimes, you know, I'm in Oakland with Kat. Oftentimes folks are like, do the police even show up here? You know, they'll call 911 and they'll just be waiting. Um, and so we have to be honest about that this election cycle. And we also have to be honest about what is required to be preventative. How do we actually reduce the violence and crime that we're seeing um, in our communities? And part of that um, is really thinking about these non-police alternatives that folks have been organizing around for a long time. Also thinking about public health as public safety, social welfare as public safety. We know that uh, the wealthiest communities um, are safe, um, not because they have hella police, they're safe because they have hella resources. They have a thriving public education system. They have a thriving public health system. Um, and oftentimes our communities are already divested from. And that's what we've been saying all along is that y'all already defunded our communities, you know? And so what we're trying to have a conversation around is how can we look at budgets and really make it equitable so that we can really have a robust infrastructure where we can keep ourselves safe. Uh, so my hope is that this report really can be utilized throughout this electoral cycles um, to really um, amplify the solutions and priorities that our folks have been working on for a long time now. Really appreciate that. Y'all, uh, this has been an amazing conversation. I don't know if you can see the hearts, the applause, the thumbs up. Uh, it seems like so much of what has been shared in this conversation is resonating uh, with folks who tuned in. So I just want you to feel that appreciation. I hope you can feel the appreciation and the gratitude that we have on just the work that went into completing this report. Um, perspectives on community safety from Black America. The link has been dropped into the chat for those who want to check it out. I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, I also dropped into the chat a link to the Vision for Black Lives so you can check out more. And when we're talking about Invest, Divest, when we're talking about uh, not just what we're reacting to, but what our vision is for our people, you can read uh, more about that. Um, I would encourage, if possible, uh, Kat and Taryn, folks are asking for that contact information. I think they wanna talk more. They want to learn more from the work you're doing on the ground. Um, also want to share my appreciation, Dr. Kumar, to you and Dr. Cohen over at Gem Forward for the tremendous uh, work that you've done to help make this report uh, come alive. And of course, Devante, uh, co-conspirator, it's always a pleasure, appreciate your perspectives. And then I wanna thank our ASL interpreters, Erica and Tierra for holding it down for the duration of this discussion. We have uh, recorded the uh, this event, so we'll be sharing it back out to our people 
uh, in the coming days. We encourage you to get in touch uh, with us if need be, but also to get in touch with each other. If anything that you've heard that you wanna speak to or you wanna learn more about, please uh, get in touch with uh, the folks here um, to learn more, we're open. Again, we have to be in relationship with each other even before we can work together, right? And so part of it is seeing each other, hearing from each other with the hope that we can build some relationships and make that solidarity real. So with that, I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Uh, and also thank you for the work that you're doing to build the reality that we know our people deserve. And we hope you'll join us for our next webinar. Uh, and we look forward to being at the front lines with you. Thanks everyone.